if you're a business owner, there's going to come a point where you need a stronger tech stack to have a clear picture of everything all in one place. From startup to enterprise, NetSuite is your one-stop solution. Visit netsuite.com slash SPI to download their KPI checklist for free and support this podcast too. If you do find yourself buried in manual work or struggling to have a clear picture of your business, you should know three numbers. 37,000, 25, and one. 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have been upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. 25, NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. And the number one, because your business is one of a kind. So you can get a customized solution for all of your KPIs and one efficient system when, with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash SPI. That's netsuite.com slash SPI to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash SPI. There was once a time when building a website was a massive undertaking and a huge pain, something that you would need to clear your entire schedule for. Well, guess what? Those days are over, and now you can build a professional, sparkling website in just seconds, thanks to Hostinger. In fact, I recently did this, and I shared the process on my YouTube channel, and it was absolutely mind-blowing, especially considering it took like days on end previously when I first started building websites. This tool is amazing, and I was using AI to do it. So Hostinger is a top highly rated global web hosting and website creation brand, right? And all you have to do to build a website is answer three questions. Here it is. You enter your brand name, you select the website type, you describe your business, and then you can customize it further with a drag and drop editor. It's literally that simple. I just went through this process. I promise you, it is the easiest way to build a website. And it also offers some AI-driven SEO-friendly copy, an AI logo maker. Plus, they make all this super affordable. It's less than $3 a month, including a free domain name. So create a live website now at hostinger.com slash SPI. And listeners of this podcast can enter SPI for 10% off your order and a free domain name. H-O-S-T-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash SPI and use the code SPI for 10% off and a free domain name. It's incredible. Now back to the show. This is the Smart Passive Income Podcast with Pat Flynn, session number 263. Ladder up. Welcome to the Smart Passive Income Podcast, where it's all about working hard now so you can sit back and reap the benefits later. And now your host, He's uh, undecided whether or not becoming a meme is a good thing. Pat Flynn. If you're at a desk a lot like I am, it is really important to move around and increase circulation as much as possible. And a sit slash stand desk can be a massive game changer. If you haven't tried one before, this offer from Uplift is for you. Plus, you can support the show at the same time. Visit upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. Uplift Desk is the place to go. There are so many customization options, plus free 30-day returns, free shipping, free accessories with every desk. And did I mention the industry-leading 15-year warranty? It's no wonder they've been wire cutters pick for six years in a row. Plus, they offer a great range of ergonomic chairs and storage systems if you want to give your whole workspace a makeover. They even have an augmented reality feature so you can see what your new desk will look like in your space using your phone. I mean, they even make a height-adjustable conference table that doubles as a regulation size ping-pong table. These folks have really thought of it all. And if you want to build the workstation of your dreams, I highly recommend checking them out. Just go to upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. That's U-P-L-I-F-T desk.com slash SPI to get 5% off your entire order. What up, everybody? Pat Flynn here. Thank you so much for joining me in this episode of the Smart Passive Income Podcast. I appreciate you so much for being here. We got a great, great episode today with none other than Clay Collins, the CEO and co-founder of Lead Pages, a company that I advise. Uh, that's awesome, and I highly recommend you check them out. But before that, let's listen in because what Clay is bringing to us today, actually, by the way, he's been on the show before, episode 78, I always refer to that. I remember, I memorize that one because it is one of the top downloaded podcasts ever. It's also one that I get the most responses from ever because it was just very clear uh, that Clay was just delivering so much value and helping us build our email list rapidly. Well, this one is about 
how to build a seven figure business by building a 7K per month business. And what he means by that is basically he's gonna go over the story of how lead pages started. And it didn't start out that way. It started by him being a blogger. Uh, and it's just a really interesting story, his origin story, and which later became his hero story here. Now he's built this amazing company and uh, he's doing very well and he gives us really good advice along the way. So we're gonna take it step by step, laddering up. Here's Clay Collins from Lead Pages. Let's do this. What's up, guys? I'm so happy to welcome back uh, the person who's provided us the number one most downloaded episode in the history of the SPI podcast, and that is Clay Collins, CEO and uh, co-founder of Lead Pages. Clay, welcome back to the show. Thank you for coming back. Pat, I am I am stoked to be here. I'm on a personal mission to beat the record download <laughs> that you know download number that we set for the last podcast episode we did together. So uh, today you know, lots to get into, but we're giving people a full on course. I'm giving people not only a roadmap to building something really phenomenal with their business, but we're going to be giving away mind maps, mind maps, transcripts, worksheets, outlines. Um, you know, those courses on Udemy that they sell for 200 bucks. I, I want people to get at least $200 worth of value from this and to get something that would be at least as rich as something they'd pay uh, a, a couple hundred dollars for. Yeah, you know, the first time you were on in episode 78, you had uh, said similar things about building people's email lists. And since then, uh, and that was years ago, I mean, I continually get messages from people saying just how helpful that particular episode was. And now we're kind of stepping it up uh, even more. It's not just email we're talking about right now. We're talking about just building businesses because you've obviously uh, done very well with lead pages. And I was there right at the beginning, even before it started. And uh, just to see how far it's gone, it's, it's really inspirational. I think you are so, so successful with, with what lead pages is now. It, this is going to be a nice sort of rewind to talk a little bit about the history and how it kind of all, all got started, but also be, like you said, a nice blueprint or a roadmap for people to um, to shoot for because what we're going to be talking about here, and a lot of you probably already know a little bit because of the the headline. You know, we're we're talking about creating something huge by not going necessarily that huge to start, but taking these steps along the way. So why don't we? You know, I think people already know who you are, and you know, we can I obviously have an idea of how well Lead Pages is doing right now, and it's continually just blowing my mind with all the great things you guys are coming out with and and what you're doing. But let's let's I'll let you take the reins, and I'll interject, and I'll I'll ask questions and put myself in the shoes of the audience as we're going. But I'll I'll let you I'll let you start and and kind of walk us through this process. Fantastic. So the title of this podcast or of this mini course that I want your readers to receive uh, and listeners to receive is called Laddering Up, How to Build a Seven-Figure Business by Building a 7K Per Month Business First. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, talk about laddering up and the whole notion of of laddering it up and, and what that means for your business. And the second thing is we're going to talk about how you specifically can start a, a seven-figure business by starting out with something really small, something really manageable mm. that you can start implementing in the next couple of weeks. And, you know, I, I know there's a bunch of sort of internet marketing guru courses. There's a bunch of scams out there. And as a background here, all of this is free. I literally have nothing to sell other than like a $37 per month landing page product. And I'm not even going to be pitching that here. So everything here is free. I don't have some course on the back end. There's not some webinar upsell. Uh, and the second thing is that uh, is that I've done it. So uh, lead pages started out as a blog back in the day. And, you know, we turned it into a business that uh, last year, did 25 million in revenue. We've raised 38 million in venture capital. Crazy. And uh, so so I'm not just sort of uh, speaking here as someone who's only done this with webinars or information products or stuff. Like everything I'm going to be talking about here, we've, we've actually done uh, multiple times now. So uh, please, please know that as, as, as the background. So the, the main concept behind all of this is the idea of laddering up. And I learned about laddering up by first kind of watching Netflix. So if you look at Netflix as a company, Netflix started off by distributing DVDs that they bought at places like Walmart. So they found kind of these freely available DVDs and they just started shipping them to people. So they leveraged uh, an advantage over Blockbuster that uh, there were no late fees mm -hmm. And that they could offer a much wider select selection because they had these centrally located warehouses. 
and they went head to head with the blockbusters of the world and they won. But that was just the first rung of Netflix's ladder. They were essentially, you know, that's rung one was like Netflix is a logistics company. So they had enough success there that they started a streaming service. And, you know, having worked in fairly large businesses, I can only imagine the turmoil that Netflix was experiencing uh, at that time. They've got all these people in there that operate warehouses that understand sort of um, distribution logistics Mm -hmm. and how to ship things to different places at specific times. And all of a sudden now they're hiring, um, you know, DevOps people and they're buying servers and they need to figure out streaming technology. And so even though from the outside, it looks like they're doing roughly the same thing internally, they're undergoing a huge shift uh, as a business. So the next rung of Netflix's ladder is that they become a, a, a streaming service and they still deliver DVDs, but they start streaming movies online and they develop a much larger audience. They develop an international audience and they start uh, just like raking in the customers. Uh, they then leverage that position to become a production studio, right? So they start mm-hmm. producing movies uh, or series like Stranger Things, which like they financed and they own all the characters. It's not like Marvel where Marvel owns the character. Like they own that whole franchise. So essentially, uh, in, a, in a matter of decades, they go from a company that mails DVDs to a company that is competing with and starting to beat uh, HBO and private movie studios. Uh, and it's it's pretty fascinating. And I'm sure there's a fourth rung on that ladder. Uh, there's a similar path that, you know, Apple took. Apple started with uh, basically an MP3 player that was called Sound Jam that they bought. They turned that into iTunes. Um, they leveraged that success there. They had this rip, big, mix, burn campaign, and they came out with the iPod, right? So they started out with an MP3 player. Then they came out with the iPod. Then they came out with the iPhone, Um and kind of the the rest is history. And and if you look at lead pages, or if you look at uh, our our business, you know, I started off with a tiny self help blog, and that did so well that uh, I kind of transitioned into selling affiliate products in the green uh, in the in the green niche niche. So like composting pills and stuff like that. That did so well that um, I started doing uh, SEO and freelance consulting. That worked out so well that I created a WordPress plugin app called WelcomeGate. WelcomeGate helped us produce a WordPress plugin that was paid. So I went from a free WordPress plugin to a paid WordPress plugin called Lead Player. That worked out so well that we came out with leadpages.net. Um, and that worked out so well that we acquired a company called Drip. So we went from a one product company to a multi product company. And um, I think when people look at building businesses, they often look at the business they want to build and not the business that they can start today and then plot a course from the business they can start today to the business they eventually want to have. And that is uh, essentially what I want to talk about. I mean, Pat, what's what's been your laddering up journey? Yeah, I mean, uh, Green Exam Academy, after I got let, let go, uh, yep. sort of helped me discover this world of online business, which showed me all the different opportunities that were out there. Uh, I tried some other things just to experiment and those didn't do so well but of course I created smartpassiveincome.com which started which then enabled me to try a bunch of different niche sites and now I've leveled up to now doing software Uh, and then also on top of that there's speaking which I never thought I would do Uh, writing books becoming a best-selling author and now I'm doing philanthropy I'm also getting involved with some uh, policy related things related to education and kids and stuff of, of course that would have never even happened if I hadn't started small, right? And yep. I, lo- I love this idea of laddering up because I think when you can kind of come up with a plan like this, it can help you uh, take those steps to get to where you want to go. Now, my question to you is, did Netflix, did Apple, did Lead Pages was, was this the plan or was it kind of like, did you have this goal and kind of backtrack and start at the first domino or, or, or did it kind of just kind of organically get shaped that way? Yeah, you know, I, I think... What happens is that at every rung of the ladder, as you're climbing up, your perspective, your visibility, your vantage point becomes enlarged. Totally. So when I first started, I just wanted to quit graduate school. I was in graduate school. I absolutely hated it. I wanted to 
get out of what felt like a rat race to me. And I, I just wanted freedom. And so I, I just needed to make like, you know, five to six K a month. Actually, before that, I just needed to start making two to three K a month. And I was able to do that. And every single time I got a greater deal of freedom, um, sort of my my vision enlarged. So I, I don't think it's possible to know exactly what's like maybe five steps up the ladder, mm -hmm. but you might know what the next one could be. And once you get there, you'll be <laughs> inspired to bigger and greater things. Right, right. No, I love that. And I think that provides a lot of inspiration for people listening because they, a lot of them are starting at the bottom or they're on maybe ladder rung number one or two and who knows how far they can go. But I'd love to know, how do we progress up this ladder? What are some of the signs to look out for? Like what's what's the next um, step? Or actually, where, where do they even start? Yeah, so let's talk about how audience, you know, pe people listening to this podcast can start on the ladder themselves. And so I'm going to suggest a path. It doesn't have to be your path, but I do think that this is a viable option for people listening to this content who, who just wanna get started. So uh, uh, ladder rung one, I think for most people who are attracted to the kind of content that you produce and are interested in passive income and are interested in, you know, an online business or online marketing, um, what has worked for me and what has worked for the majority of businesses that I've seen be successful here is to start by building a minimum viable audience. So I've heard a lot of people talk about you know, creating a minimum viable product. And a lot of folks start with product creation. Mm -hmm. And in my view, that's absolutely not the right way to go. You should start by learning how to build an audience and then letting your interaction with that audience dictate the product you should create. So there's there's three rungs of the ladder that I'm going to outline that uh, outline for folks, uh, you know, Ladder, uh, ladder rung one is create a minimum viable audience. Ladder rung two is start selling your first product and get to six figures. And ladder rung three is about optimizing and building a real business to get to, to seven figures. But let's start with ladder rung one. Um, the, the purpose here and, and what I would encourage folks to do is take three to six months and get an audience of around 2,000 uh, email subscribers. You can use something like uh, drip.co or something like ConvertKit, something like MailChimp, um, uh, which is free. But I'd say your first goal is to build a minimum viable audience. Now, most people before doing this waste time on a whole bunch of things, but I really truly believe this, that building an audience is hands down the best marketing and best business education you can possibly get. Um, every single time you publish a blog post, you're essentially launching a new idea into your market and learning uh, which ideas, which concepts take hold and which don't. You might find that sometimes you'll publish a blog post and uh, you'll get a lot of comments, but you won't get a lot of shares. Other times you might get a ton of shares, but you won't get a lot of comments. Other times that blog post uh, might get a lot of click throughs to a, a lot of uh, to another site or it, it might sell a lot of a, an affiliate product or an affiliate offering but you don't have shares uh, or comments and it's important to start identifying how your audience responds to concepts ideas calls to action uh, etc and the truth is this if you can't get 2,000 people to follow your blog, the odds of you getting folks to buy your product are slim to numb because you just won't have the marketing chops to make that happen. Nice. Okay. Now, even rewinding before that, like how do we choose an audience that's right? Because MVP, minimum viable audience, 2,000 is the minimum. How do we determine, you know, is this based on our passions? Is this based on market research? Like how would you recommend somebody even get started on choosing an audience to, to target? Yeah. So I would say, and, and my experience has been having worked with uh, thousands of businesses now at this point, mm -hmm. you should absolutely go with your passion. There's 6 billion people in the world now. Now there's 7 billion people. Um, there are billions of people online. If you're passionate about something, there are other people who will be passionate about that too. And um, I wouldn't get heavily involved with market research because at the end of the day, 
you're going to be building uh, uh, you, you want to build a, uh, an audience of passionate followers and they're not going to be passionate about what you have to say unless you're passionate about it. So that's thing number one. But thing number two is that eventually you're going to need to sell them a product. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it is so important when it comes to selling a product that you have a product that you can legitimately with the full force of your character and uh, integrity that that you're selling a product that you believe in that you love and that you truly think is the very best thing that your audience uh, can purchase for them uh and the only way to do that is if it's connected to your passion otherwise you just won't be able to sell like you need to i have seen so many like so many businesses that end up dying because the owners self-sabotage themselves because they're afraid to tell their family that they're selling this product. They're afraid to, you know, show up and, and, you know, they'll be sitting around with a circle of friends and energetically they're held back mm -hmm. because they just, they just can't stomach to tell, you know, their, their, their friends from graduate school or from high school that they're selling a, uh, a, like a tinnitus product when they've literally never had that issue or, you know, if they're selling, you know, uh, an ebook on how to do affiliate marketing and they've never been successful as an affiliate marketer before, like they're just not going to be able to bring the force of presence mm -hmm. and passion to knock it out of the park. So I, I think it's, I would go with, with passion first and foremost. What are your thoughts? Pat? No, I, I like that. But passion with the uh, with sort of the criteria of, okay, let's start with the passion, see if you can get 2,000 people to follow you on that. If not, yep. then you know that that's, that's not the case. There's also a couple other tests that you can do. I like the test of you know considering whether or not this is something you'd be comfortable sharing with your friends because uh, then you're always gonna hold back if, if you're not even even that. Um, so there's a few things. First of all, I, I like uh, the gr what I call the grandma test. It's almost the same thing, but like would you be comfortable sitting at your grandma's house, like telling her what you're doing. Like if not, then well, maybe that's not what you should be doing. Um, also, number two is is if it helps also, because typically when you have a passion for something, you're also very involved in it yourself. So you are your own avatar, basically. You're building something that's sometimes almost for, for you or somebody just like you. And so to, to consider whether or not you would actually purchase this thing or use this thing, it, it really you know, it starts to make you think about the ethics of this and, you know, the morality and whatnot. So I think that's important too. And then the, the final thing, you know, you might be kind of like, oh, 2,000, that's not very much. But uh, some of you might remember Kevin Kelly's essay called A Thousand True Fans, which very much just knocks you over the head with, hey, you don't need a lot of people. You don't need a blockbuster hit or a world-changing product yet or to start. What you need is to change somebody's world first and just a thousand people, for example, who just are absolutely in love with what you do, which isn't very many people when it, when it, when it comes down to it, um, can really help you support kind of this first leg of your journey. So uh, yeah, I agree with you on, on all those things. So two, 2,000 for MVA, if you will, before any sort of product even comes into play, right? Yep, and the reason I like 2,000 is because in my experience, a list of 10,000 is a million dollar per year business. Uh, when your list is smaller, you know, in the 1,000 to 2,000 category, I've seen people typically make $2, you know, in, in the in the space we're talking about, you know, selling their, their own product to a mm -hmm. passionate audience. I've seen people make about $2 per subscriber per month. So if you're getting to at, at this phase one with a minimum viable audience, you're setting yourself up to make about 4,000 per, uh, you know, per month, which is a, a decent start to liberating yourself and, you know, it, it's it's a nice sort of runway and launching pad to the next thing. Right. Now, in terms of the email list, obviously, there are going to be people in the audience who have more than 10,000 who aren't making a million. And so the question is, well, it's not just about the number of the people on the email list, but it's about the quality of the person on the email list, right? So just to kind of say, okay, it's not just about collecting email subscribers. It's really getting these people who have and follow the same passions as you and who, who you really want to connect with. So I would say really high engagement on each of those emails that you're sending out, right? 
Yeah, I, I so I, I think it's it's the quality of a, of of a of a few different things. So first, it's it it is the quality of the lead. The second thing, though, is it's about the quality of the business model behind behind the business. So if you are uh, an aspiring professional blogger and you have a list of two thousand and you don't have a a solid business model behind that or a mature and sophisticated online business model behind it. Like you, you know, you might not even be making a hundred dollars a month. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, so, so we're, we're just on ladder rung, right? Uh, ladder rung one right now, when we get to ladder rung two, we'll start to talk about how to create a mature business model, uh, but behind that. So no, I, I, I actually, for ladder rung one, where the goal is only to get to 2,000 subscribers, you will you will not be making two dollars per subscriber per month when you're at ladder rung one. Um, as we transition into the second rung of the ladder, you absolutely can get to a place where you're making that kind of revenue. On ladder rung number one, in terms of the business model and kind of preparing yourself for that, you know, you've gotten this audience, 2,000 people, the MBA. Yep. Uh, I think a lot of people go or approach their audience with, okay, I'm gonna sell, you know, an online course. And they, you know, again, they're going, even though they have the audience, they're still starting with the product in terms of how to serve their audience. Yep. How, how would you best utilize this audience that you've built to determine what kind of product to then create or what kind of business model to have? Yeah, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't start selling a product at this stage other than something like consulting. So, you know, I would encourage folks to have one page on their website that offers an hour of your time that doesn't overpromise, that doesn't have crazy guarantees, but where you're selling uh, an, an hour of consultation uh, with with you and sell it for something like 50 bucks or a hundred bucks. But I wouldn't focus too much on monetization at this phase because it can be, it can start to get really distracting. And the truth is it's not super hard if you are busting, your, it's not super hard to get to 2000 subscribers. You know, you can set a goal like three subscribers per day, mail friends, uh, you know, find people, uh, on, on Twitter, um, you know, participate in forums, but it, it's not super hard to get to that, this phase. So I don't see people hanging out at the, this rung of the ladder for, for like a year. Uh, it's, a, it's a short phase, but the purpose of this phase is to become absolutely obsessed with the ideas, with the concepts, with the, the phrasing and formatting and presentation of ideas to a specific audience in a way that gets them to comment and subscribe. And um, this is kind of like your your rite of passage into this world. If you can't figure out um, messaging that that gets shared, that gets people passionate enough to enter their email address, then then you probably shouldn't go to the next level. So I, I wouldn't get too distracted here. Uh, with with product or monetization, right? It almost some, serves as a form of validation, not just for building the audience, but for yourself. Like, can you actually stay engaged with this audience? Does it does it still excite you after however many months does it take to build, uh, you know, this this audience? Like, I love that you use the word obsessed because that's the mindset that you have to have uh, to, to succeed. And, and I also very much appreciate the suggestion for consulting. I often suggest that people when they're getting started out, uh, also do freelancing, but it's the same thing. You're utilizing your time in the world or new space that you're obsessed with. And what that does is even though you might not be getting paid very much, you are there in that world, putting yourself in it, learning about it, learning the ins and outs. And, and with consulting specifically, you'll be able to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with people about specifically the problems that they're having. And you can actually utilize that time, not just to you know help you get started and generate an income and help somebody, obviously, which is important, but you're collecting feedback at the same time. I mean, it's, it's almost like research for you at the same time. So I, I think that's a genius idea. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, and that's exactly why you want to do consulting is you want to find out people's fears, people's objections, what makes them tick, you know, um, genuinely, you know, generally speaking, uh, the things you learn often won't be as exciting as you imagine them to be because you're going to hear people's roadblocks, people's objections, the things people struggle with at night, the things that keep, you know, keep people up. And if you're in a space where there's real need, there's likely to be, you know, suffering, uh, pain, <laughs> right. um, anxiety about different issues. 
and and to and to talk to people one on one and to get paid for that is a true privilege. I also encourage people uh, at this phase and actually at 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 the two other rungs of the ladder that we're going to go through um, to respond to everything. So when I was at this phase. I had a personal development blog called The Growing Life uh, a long time ago, and I would I responded to every single tweet. I responded to every single comment. I had a search for my name, um, and every time my name was mentioned in a forum, I would leave a comment. And I was so hungry to grow my email list and to grow my subscriber account that every time someone left a comment, I would actually personally email them, write something about their comment and how I was grateful and ask them to subscribe. And they they didn't all subscribe, but many of them did. And so I was able to go from like zero to 4,000 subscribers in like three months. Uh, so it absolutely is possible. And I think this is this is where I learned to write copy. At the end of the day, you can take co- courses on copywriting. You can, you know, you can uh, invest in all kinds of different training, but there is there is no replacement for seeing if people will actually subscribe to yourself. And I found that most people overestimate how hard it is to get someone to subscribe to their list, but they underestimate how hard it is to get someone to buy their products. So most people think it's super easy to sell products, but harder to get people to subscribe to their list. And it's actually the opposite of that. It's it's harder to sell products and it's easier to get people to subscribe to your list. But certainly this is true. If you can't get 2,000 people to subscribe to your audience or to your list, you're absolutely not going to get 2,000 people to buy your product. It's just not gonna happen. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So that's the, the we're, we're uh, finishing up ladder rung number one. I feel right. Where are we transitioning yep. now into ladder rung number two? Where are people at uh, at the start of ladder rung number two, and where do they go from there? Yeah. So at the start of ladder rung number two, they have a minimum viable audience of two thousand subscribers, and the goal is to within twelve months of ladder rung number two to Ha- to to get to the place where you're making six figures in terms of your um, annual revenue. So it's not that you need to make six figures within 12 months of getting to 2,000 subscribers. It's that by 12 months after you've gotten to 12,000 uh, subscribers, that the amount you make in that 12th month is at least, uh, you know, six figures divided or, um, $100,000 divided by 12. So it's like 8,333 or something like that. So mm-hmm. so you want to get to the point where you're making 8,000 8,000 and 9,000 within uh on that on that 12th month. 12th month after you uh have 2,000 subscribers. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. I think I think yeah, okay, good. Um and how do we do that? <laughs> okay. So the 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 best thing that I've seen to get people to accomplish this. And, you know, before I sold software and did consulting and created scalable businesses, um, I, I help small businesses and online businesses with their marketing. And this is, this, what I'm about to present is how we accomplish this. And it's called the rule of five ones. And here's the rule of five ones. You should limit yourself to selling one product, whatever that flagship product is. You should limit yourself to one conversion mechanism. So that's either a sales page, um, you know, launches, sales videos, webinars, telephone, if you're doing one-on-one sales, but you get one product, you get one conversion mechanism, you get one traffic source. So that's either SEO, it's partnerships, it's pay-per-click, but focus on one and limit yourself to one. I mean, you, you, you might get others for free without trying, but limit yourself to one. It's going to take one year to find the, the, the right ones, right? So the, the right combination of product conversion mechanism and traffic source. And then it's going to take one more year after that to get to 1 million in revenue. So rung two is about sort of this rule of five ones, one product, one conversion mechanism, one traffic source, that's it. Uh, don't get ADD. And 
there's a lot of reasons for this. This is where most people start breaking down. But if you start thinking about the the combinatorics <laughs> of messing with different configurations here, you can start to see how things get really complex really fast. So if you have two products, two sales, me- so let's say you have two products, you got an entry level product and a high level product. You have two sales mechanisms, uh, a webinar, and let's say a sales page, and you have three traffic sources. Maybe you're doing uh, joint venture partnerships, pay-per-click and SEO. That's literally 12 different combinations. And it's it's super hard to do. And even if you can accomplish this, you know, with, you know, by being somewhat ADD, even if you can get to six figures by by being somewhat ADD after this first year, I don't believe you're going to be able to get to seven figures the next year unless you go uh, super deep like I'm advocating. So being focused here isn't just about hitting your goal in this 12 months. It's about hitting your goal during the the following 12 months and, and building something that you can scale. Yeah. I can feel the passion and I can also hear it. I, I think you're banging on the table as you're uh, speaking because <laughs> you're so, no, 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 I, I love it. It's like, it's like, you know, when you clap, when you say things to emphasize it, it's, so, it's yep. almost like that. So I think people, it's resonating with people. Um, I love, I love this focus of the one thing, right? Which kind of reminds us all of the book that I always talk about, The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. I mean, this is, this is the idea of sort of essentialism even in, in marketing, you know, just focusing on the one sort of funnel, the one path. And, and I really love that idea. Uh, to clarify just really quick in terms of how long this should take. Um, so product conversion, traffic source, one year, like you, you had first mentioned one year to get to seven figures. So in rung, in rung two, uh-huh. the goal is to get to six, six figures, figures okay. uh, to, to get to a, a six figure annualized revenue by the 12th month. So let's say it takes you three months to get a minimum viable audience of 2000 people. Mm-hmm. And then 12 months after that, uh, so that's 15 months out. By that 15 month, 15th month, you'll be making uh, eight to 9,000. That's the goal. It's really funny because that is the exact amount of time that it took my very first website, greenexamacademy.com, to begin monetizing after it was first started. When I first started using it, it's just simply a tool. Uh, and then I started to build an audience from there. And then about 15, 16 months later, that's when I began to monetize. And I had made about $8,000 at that point. Uh, so it, it does take that long. And even with Smart Passive Income, which was built not even to ever make a dime, it was just to kind of share everything at some point in the, in the mar- year and a half mark uh, with affiliate marketing and with the sort of authority that had gained over time, uh, just providing a ton of value. It, it took about that much time to get to a significant level where I was making about six figures from that particular property. So that's that I would agree with that. I mean, in terms of timing um, and for some of you that might be like, oh, well, that's, you know, that's a long time. It's like a year from now. Like I need to make money now, but it's not that much at the start. You could, you kind of, you know, work your way toward that. Um, and then also it actually is a very short amount of time when, you know, in the grand scheme of things, right? Uh, I think a lot of people in other industries would just die to get a chance to earn six figures within a year, right? Like think of everybody investing in the stock market and all this stuff. And this, I feel is a better route because you are in more control of this. Uh, so in terms of, okay, let's, let's talk about these, these individual parts actually. So, so the product, like how do we, is you had mentioned that first and is that because that's, that's where it starts even before you determine sort of conversions. Well, I guess it makes sense. Even before you determine conversions into that product, you have to know what that product's going to be. Am I right? Yeah. So by one product, I, I really mean one offer, right? So Mm -hmm. it's, it's the whole packaging. It's not just what is the product? It's what is the product? How is it delivered? What's the guarantee behind it? One promise. Yes. What's, what's the pricing plan behind it? So it's, it's really that whole package. So another way to to say it would be one, one offer. Mm -hmm. And it's really, you know, I I don't want to prescribe here exactly what it should be for some folks. This will be a membership site for other people. This will be software for other folks. It'll be a physical product that's shipped to you. For other folks, it might be a three-month coaching program. You know, like, the I guess the purpose of the first rung of the ladder is to have a foothold into the psychology of a given market mm-hmm. and to understand 
at a pretty deep level, what makes that market tick, what gets them excited, what products they're buying, what ideas are changing their life. And at the second rung in the ladder, you're leveraging that knowledge to try and, uh, you know, to, 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 to monetize that audience um, while serving them. Let's talk about the mindset of selling. I think this is what holds a lot of people back. I know a lot of people who are in ladder rung two right now who the only part that's missing is they don't, they're not selling their product, the product that they yep. probably know they should build or maybe they've built it already, but they're just not selling it with, with confidence. How do you confidently sell something to this MVA that you've built? Yeah, great question. So what's interesting is like for me, my ladder rung number two for me was not, I wasn't selling with a sales page. I wasn't selling with launches. I was selling via webinars and I started out just doing Q and a on my topic. So I would get on a webinar every single week, sometimes twice a week, and I would answer questions and I would offer my product as a solution to folks when I could. And that allowed me to like hear objections to understand exactly how folks were considering buying my product. But I would absolutely set up um, a, you know, you've got 2000 people at this point. So you probably have access to, um, to, to an, an audience that takes action on, on your calls to action. You know, if you invite them to a webinar, they're going to show up and you probably have access to affiliates at that point, maybe. But I would encourage folks just to do a, to, to do webinars. And the reason for that is because it's a short sales cycle. You know after the webinar, if there's 100 people on the webinar and only two people bought, you know you're not doing that great of a job. If you're getting a quarter of the folks to purchase, you know you're doing a great job. So what I would encourage folks to do is, is – um, is what I did, set up a weekly webinar, measure the conversion rate of that webinar, and try and, and, and ensure that that conversion rate goes up over time. And you might want to, before you start even doing webinars, you might want to just folks uh, like use Calendly, use a tool like Calendly and set up one-on-one -on -one sessions and start selling to folks one-on-one. -on -one. But I think the mistake so many people make is to really sell from their heels and to try and sell by not selling. I think if, if you want to make sales, then you need to, to sell to folks. And, um, and there's just, there's no substitute for having another person on the other end of the phone, you know, considering your product and, and, and being, you know, being really upfront about selling it to them if, if that's what they want. So I would just do it. You know, I would just try and make sales. You know, I think it still scares a lot of people. Like, how would you speak to the people who are like, ah, I just, I'm not comfortable selling. Like, I'm just, it's hard. I, I get nervous. I get scared. Um, you know, my advice would be to realize that, well, hopefully what it is that you're building is something that's going to help them. Uh, and yep. you, you know about their pains and problems and you, you almost are, this is almost your duty, right? Because this is, this is, you're coming from a place of serving, hopefully, uh, and you've built this thing or you are building this thing if you want to, uh, for example, do a beta launch, which which I would recommend if, for example, the product mm -hmm. that you're creating is a membership site or, or a course of some kind. Um, that way you can just kind of have a validation iteration in there. Uh, but but either way, I, I mean, what, I, what got me over the hump of, you know, I'm too scared to sell or I think I'm selling out or, you know, I, I'm afraid of what people will say. It's like if you come from a place of serving and you really truly believe in this thing that you're building, well, then there's not going to be an issue. Yeah. I completely agree with that. I think it really has to do with what your mindset is. So if you are building an audience simply and purely to sell to them, to, in, you know, to quote unquote, monetize your audience, then I think you're going to feel icky about it because that is kind of icky. If you're creating a blog because you're passionate about a group of people and you're really trying to serve them and you're delivering enormous value, then your customers will likely feel like purchasing your product is a small way to repay you for what you're delivering to them for yep. free on a daily basis. So uh, like if we take lead pages, for example, you know, we have now about eight free courses. Each of those courses has eight plus videos. They have transcripts. 
we we have two full time people whose entire job it is to create free courses for our market, and we don't charge for them. Like we're not trying to get anything out of it other than rapport with our market and and you know an introduction to our tools, but everything we do is about providing economic empowerment to individuals and small and medium sized businesses and selling a product is just one component of that overall mission. So it's, it's not, it's just, it's just not weird, you know? And and I think uh, a good analogy to this is maybe dating, right? If you, if you meet someone at a bar and like, like, I don't want to be crass here, but if you meet someone at a bar, you're going to feel icky if every interaction you have with them is to like try and get them to sleep with you that night. But if you meet someone, you actually find that you like them, you enjoy them as a friend, and you care about them deeply, then at some point, uh, asking them out isn't that gross of a thing. It's just kind of where the relationship is naturally leading. And I would encourage you to just provide such tremendous value to your market that it's just not a weird, awkward thing to to charge them. Yeah, I mean, I love that you mentioned this sort of natural uh, thing that just happens as a result of the value you've provided. I think it was my buddy, Chris Ducker, who you know, obviously, uh, yep. who, who said that, you know, the sales process, well, the sales process is everything that happens in the in terms of building the relationship and serving and building value. And then the actual pitch just becomes the natural conclusion to that whole process. It just becomes part of the flow. It, it shouldn't f- ever feel icky if you do all those other things right. Uh, and, and that you had just kind of validated that. So that, that that's awesome. Um, that's, that's spot on. I, I also think that if, if you're doing a great job serving your market, you'll start to hear with this minimum viable audience, you'll start to hear them asking you if you're going to have a product or there's, they'll start hearing product. You, you will start hearing product recommendations. Yep. They'll start coming to you and saying, Hey, I just bought product X or product Y. And, I didn't really like it that much. What would you suggest that I purchase to help me attain this outcome? And I believe that if you are true, like if you, if you care quite a bit about your market and you care about products in your market, what will likely happen is you'll get pissed off that people are buying crappy products that you don't think are serving them very well. And it, it almost will be like a response to the buying behavior of that market to provide an alternative that really saves them from crappy solutions in their space. So I I hope that's how you feel about it. I hope it's not like, you know, like you're a wolf and buyers are sheep and you're somehow, you know, isolating them one by one and, and picking them off and killing them. That isn't what it should feel like. It should feel like, they're going in a direction that isn't serving them. They're buying other products in the market they're in, and you know a better way, and you're actually doing them a favor. Uh, that's, I think that's the best way to approach it, or you're, you're serving them, and it should come from this kind of higher place. That's, yeah. that's how I got started. Now, did you, when you started, um, did you feel any of the uh, 80-20 rule and all that stuff? I think this is another important thing that people in Ladder 2 should focus on is like you're going to be doing a bunch of things and hopefully be focusing on the sort of rule of five here uh, or the rule of five ones, excuse me. Uh, but, you know, you're going to have a hand in many different things and you're going to try different things. Some things are going to work better than others. Uh, I think it's important to, during this process, also pay attention to, well, what is providing you the most uh, results? And, um, y- y- you know, how conscious should people be of sort of that sort of thinking and, and traffic and conversions like and, yep. and making decisions based off of those kinds of things? Or is it, is it really just, okay, I'm going to pick one and I'm going to stick with it. Yeah. So it's um, it, it, like it, it focus is so important here. And so in addition to the rule of there's, there's two fives here, there's the rule of five ones, uh, which we've talked about and we can write out for folks. So it, it's, um, if you go to the session notes for this podcast, I'll make sure Pat has all of these. You can get the reference material, cool. Thank you. but so in addition to the rule of five ones, there's also the five commandments. And, uh, here are the five commandments that go with ladder rung two. All right. The first commandment is thou shalt only have one business. 
(laughs) (laughs) So if you're going to have a second business, you need to shut down the first, all right? Thou shalt only have one business for at this stage. Maybe as you get more advanced down the road, you can have multiple businesses. But at this stage, thou shalt only have one business. Two, thou shalt only have one offer. Um, You know, commandment number three, thou shalt not spend more than one day per month creating products after you've, after your launch, right? Before that, you'll spend more time. But after you've launched it, you can't spend more than one day per month on product creation because you need to focus on selling your product, not on continually making it better, thinking that if you refine module three of your product for the 20th time, that that will be the one thing that gets people to buy. Right, similar to uh, blogging, right? Like people are blogging every single day and they're not even giving their chance, a chance to have their blog posts as they come out be shared and really get in there and uh, be, be, be spread around. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's for most people who blog, it's just about creation and not the actual, yep. you know, getting people to, to see their stuff. Yep. Uh, exactly. Uh, rule number four, thou shalt not spend more than one day per month on content marketing, unless content marketing is your one traffic source. Um, and five, thou shalt find beauty in depth rather than breadth. <laughs> Can you expand on that one? Yeah. I have found that when you when folks are new to something they tend to get pulled in a million different directions and engage in a lot of very ADD like behavior and it's it's really detrimental and what i encourage folks to do at this phase at this phase is to to find beauty in going deep on the things on a few things that interest you rather than going wide. So you might think that you have a traffic problem. And so you simultaneously buy a Pinterest marketing course, an SEO marketing course, a affiliate marketing course, and a pay-per-click marketing course. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to learn them all simultaneously. What I would instead do is like the rule of five ones, I would find one traffic source, one conversion mechanism, one product, and I would find beauty in in the subtleties of each of those art forms. I would go I would go deep, learning the nuances of how to create results there, rather than finding meaning in being able to you know go into forums and list off twenty different things that you know could work and like it's really funny. I, I hear a lot of people who sound like experts in forums, but are, don't have a lot of results in their business. And then I, uh, the people that usually seem to be having a lot of results really can't talk, talk fancy in forums because their knowledge is a, just a lot more nuanced in a few places. And that's not sexy. Right. Okay. So we got the, the rule of five ones. The five commandments, we're still in ladder rung number two, but we, as a reminder, at the end of the year, after you've built your MVA, so about, uh, you do that for three months, and then you're going to, for a year, build up this business. You're going to have a plan with the one product, the one traffic source, the one conversion mechanism. Uh, and then by the end of this year, you're going to hopefully have uh, sort of uh, what's called a monthly run rate, if, if that's indeed your business model. But, you know, get to a point where you're generating um, you know, that six figure income at the monthly level. Yep. Okay. Yep. Ab- ab- absolutely. And and I would say to folks that if you're, if you're wondering what your one conversion mechanism should be and what your one traffic source should be, I would go with what you personally buy from. <laughs> so if you find that you really like webinars and that you attend a lot of webinars, then I would make, the webinar, your conversion mechanism. If you find that you read a lot of blogs and you're really interested in being a participant in the blogging community, then I would focus on blogging. But I would, I would really focus on on one of these. Um, yeah, I, I, I would. Uh, that that really is the way. So okay. So the order here <laughs> is for executing against this is. Uh, step one, uh, create a product that you go to bat for, that you're passionate about, that you believe is a better alternative than the products that your blog subscribers are already asking you about, right? So create a product around that. That's step one. Uh, step two, create 
create an offer around that product. Namely, what's your guarantee going to be? What's the payment plan going to be? What bonuses are you going to offer? And, uh, and, and, and what's your price point going to be? Um, and uh, step three is to get a conversion process that you can tell the world about, right? Like if you're passionate about talking about your product, a webinar might be a great way to go. If you're more of an introvert and you're a writer, then you might want to create a, a sales page. If you have more of a sales background and you don't mind picking up the phone, you know, 15, 20 times a day, then maybe use the phone, but get something that you feel really comfortable with. And step four is get a traffic source that reliably buys via your conversion process. So if content marketing is working really well, uh, stick with that. Uh, if you are an analytical person and you like quantitative methodologies and you're really handy with spreadsheets, you might want to do something like pay-per-click marketing. Uh, if, if you really are great at partnerships and getting people to, to uh, partner with you, then you might want to go through an affiliate route, but find something that's authentic and, and, and good for you. Okay, great. And then so when does the transition or are we uh, to, to sort of ladder rung three happen? If we've gotten to that point, um, you know, I, th I also feel like some people at that point would uh, just kind of be complacent, right? Like they would just be like, oh, I've, I've made it. I'm done. I'm, I'm doing, uh, I'm doing great. Um, is that the right way to think? Or, you know, how do you check in with yourself at that point so that you can then sort of make the commitment to get to ladder rung number three? Cause it's not going to be an easy jump, I would assume to get from number two to number three. Uh, but I don't know. I'd love to hear you think your thoughts about that. Yeah. Great question. I really think it has to do with what motivates you. So I got into marketing because I wanted, I was very away motivated. I wanted freedom from graduate school. I wanted to opt out of the system. I, you know, I, I have ADD probably <laughs> I'm dyslexic probably. And I just didn't like the structures that were in place and I, I wanted to escape. So at, at first I was very, it, it was about what I was getting away from mm -hmm. rather than what I was going towards. But what I found, like for me personally, is that the more I got into the craft that is online marketing and the craft that is business, the more competent I felt, the better I knew the players in the space, the more confidence I had about a different way. And I realized that uh, probably uh, about 18 months into this, that I was no longer driven away from the things that I had left, but my motivation was now about economic empowerment and um, and gaining competency and traction in a new you know in a new way of operating in the world. And I kind of discovered along the way that my like what is lifestyle design for me is not traveling around the world, running a business from a laptop as I, you know, uh, traverse the globe in a balloon <laughs> that, that instead my version of lifestyle design was hiring the best engineers I could to tackle huge problems, that it was a privilege and an honor and all that I could ask for to spend 16 hours a day unencumbered working on the largest projects that I could imagine at the time. So lifestyle design, design for me was having the resources to hire amazing people and to invest in solving large problems. And, and that, that's what shifted for me, but that is, it isn't going to be that way for everyone. If, if you find that you're on ladder rung two and you're not inspired to go to the next rung of the ladder, then that's fine. I would just continue, <laughs> continue to invest in what's working because if you don't, there's going to be like four kids sleeping on futons in Silicon Valley eating ramen that are working 16 hours a day for like almost no pay that are going to like eventually eat your lunch. So, mm. uh, so, so, so make sure that you continue to at least invest a maintenance amount of work. <laughs> yes. Into the, your business. the maintenance part is, is important. You know, I feel like I was on ladder rung number two for quite a bit uh, and just quite ha quite happy with where I was. I mean, there was no reason to not be happy. 
Uh, but certain things have changed over the past couple of years where I really wanted to step it up for bigger reasons. And I've talked about these already earlier in the show related to philanthropy and education and whatnot. I mean, this is why I'm going big now because it's going to be this rung that leads me to the next one. Um, yeah. and, and that, you know, you, you, you can't predict those things. I mean, you kind of reassess where you want to go and your motivations, like you said, as you climb up this ladder. So with every step, what's cool is you have the freedom to, to, to do what you want when you want. Um, yeah. it's just, it's a, it's really a matter of, you know, being aware of, of yourself and your motivations along the way. It's, it's where you kind of are on autopilot all the time where it starts to get potentially dangerous. Cause then you might end up in a place that you, you don't want to be. Yep. Yeah. I, I think that's absolutely true. I think that most things in life are either getting bigger or they're getting smaller. I don't think there is such a thing as stasis. So if you get to ladder rung two and you find that you don't that you don't have visibility on the next rung of the ladder, then it it could be that you've established a nice little nest egg for yourself, that you have a nice way of operating. And I would try and figure out what the next thing is going to be in your life. You know, this might buy you three to five years of of exploration time. And, mm-hmm. and that might be mm-hmm. what you need to find what's next. But but if, if you don't want to make it bigger, it's probably going to get smaller. Now, what made you want to go bigger? I mean, you kind of it, mentioned it already, but I, I'd, love, I'd love to hear kind of a little bit more deeper about kind of why you wanted to go really big with, with lead pages. And, you know, even, yeah. when you, even when you started with lead player, I remember that's, that's when you and I first connected, actually. We were in this little Google group and you had talked about this new software that you came out with, which I thought was kind of cool. It was like a, a, yeah. a player that plays YouTube videos on your website, but also collects people's email addresses. And I was like, I want to try that. And I tried it. It was awesome. And then uh, we had that lunch or no, it was a dinner in Vegas you invited me yeah. to, and that's kind of when you revealed lead pages to me, and that was that was a big moment, obviously, and and it just has kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm I'm curious, like what what's the motivation? What's what's and then also like what's the next rung for you from here? Because you're obviously on yeah. ladder three right now. Is there a, is there a rung number four? Yeah, so I mean, there's still plenty of exploration around uh, rung three. We've got some stuff here, but there's there's. I think there's always, if you are on the path that is your life purpose, there's always the next rung of the ladder. For me, it was a combination of a few different things. First and foremost, I had found a set of ideas and tools and methodologies that allowed me to opt out of a system that would have like ground me down to nothing. And so the economic empowerment that came from a, a set of entrepreneurial principles and a, and a, and a way of viewing the world mm-hmm. freed me up in a way that like it, it, it's just made such a huge impact on my life. So that was the first thing. The second thing was the team I was working with. I loved working with my team. I had, you know, and I still do. We have some of the best technologists, some of the best thinkers, some of the best you know, writers and creative people I had ever met. So a lot of the inertia came from, you know, hey, if 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 we're able to win at the state level, what does it mean to win at the national level? Well, what about the Super Bowl? Can we win there? Mm-hmm. And I think every single success uh, allowed us to set bigger sites. And it was really just about doing bigger things with the same team. So that was the the second thing. And the I think the the third piece was just the sheer day in and day out joy that the logistics and the sort of the tactical in the trench elements of of running the business provided me with. I loved getting up in the morning and doing the things that I was doing, even if the mission wasn't there, which I love the mission. And even if the team wasn't there, I, I loved the work that I was doing. And so I think it was that combination for me that that allowed us to uh, or that allowed me to to kind of to to think bigger. Cool. I think everyone wants to expand. I, I think so, too. Um, that's awesome. Clay. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, it's, it's really awesome to hear you delve into that a little bit. Now, I'd love for you to speak on. OK, we're, we're at the uh, ladder two, really ready to go to or excuse me, rung two, ready to go to rung three. What are the steps to make that happen? I mean, this is going to be obviously much different than from one to two. Yeah. So the the third rung is all about doubling down on the things that that have worked. So 
what I call the the key to success for for success at rung three is really I call it the rule of three twos. So we had the rule of five ones. Now we've got the rule of three twos. And at at uh, at the third rung, you go from having one product, which is your your current product, having two products, which is the first product and then an upsell on your first product. So the, the, the funnel stays essentially the same. You're just adding another step to the funnel. So after people purchase your first product, you offer them, it could be a one click upsell. It could be something you sell to them on the phone. It could be something that's available later, but you have a, a higher end product. So maybe you have a membership site that's $50 a month. You might have a $2,000 coaching offer. You know, maybe you're selling folks, uh, like compost pails, you might want to offer them some sort of, um, you know, comprehensive, you know, green gardening package or bundle they can get. You know, if you're selling, you know, uh, done for you eating plans, you might want to offer fitness plans as well. You know, what, whatever that upsell is, mm-hmm. um, it, it, it's, it should be more expensive and it should be something that folks can only get to after buying your, your first product. How much more expensive? Generally speaking, it, it should be from five to ten x more expensive than okay. the first, yeah, than the than the first product. So, so you've got two products now. You should allow for two traffic sources. So, let's say you spent a year really mastering content marketing, right? You at, when you get to rung three, you might want to expand that into partnerships or a JV program at that point. So from one to two products, from one to two traffic sources, and from one to two conversion mechanisms. Let's say you're selling most of your products via a sales page. You would want to expand that to include maybe uh, webinars, or you might want to expand that to having a uh, an inbound sales process where you have one or two uh, salespeople that take calls from your community and, you know, sort of, um, you know, close close those deals over the phone. Uh, in addition, in this third rung, you're adding automation. So you're you're taking your automation to the next level. You, you know, you might have an email sequence with seven emails during rung two. In rung three, you'll probably want to add forking logic and workflows, like the kind that that we offer at Drip.co, mm-hmm. uh, which offers a free account, by the way. Um, you, you, so you'll add that kind of automation. You might want to add like chat bots to your websites. You might want to introduce automated webinars. So if you have a webinar that's working, you might want to introduce, uh, automated webinars, which you should probably disclose as being not live webinars, just to be honest, but you can make them available to people in other time zones who want to get access to that content. So you're adding automation and you're also adding tests. So you're adding, um, conversion tests like AB split testing, Mm -hmm. uh, and you're adding traffic tests. So you want to find out and Google analytics allows you to do this. You can see which segments convert better than others. You might find that people that come to your website for one keyword term convert better than people who come to your site for another keyword. You might find that people that come from social convert better than people that come from the organic search rankings. Uh, you might find that people who click on ads with one version of your value proposition convert better than people who come to your ads from a different proposi- you know, value proposition. You might find that some states or some countries convert better on your offer. So it's about tweaking, tweaking traffic and tweaking conversion rates. So uh, at this point, we could probably descend into marketing nerdery, but I think <laughs> this is the, you know, this is the basic outline. And then what's the goal? I mean, I guess yeah, it, the, it the, the goal but... is to get to seven, to get to seven figures this year. So, so minimum viable audience, you should invest the time that takes as long as it takes. I would aim for, you know, three to six months. So that's rung one. Uh, rung two is getting to six figures. Realistically, you should be able to do that within a year of getting to of getting your minimum viable audience. And rung three is takes an additional year, and that's to get to seven figures. And this is the path that I personally followed, and this is the path that I've seen so many others follow. Like Pat, you mentioned, it took you 15 months to get uh, your your first website or, you know, to get your business here. I, this is sort of a pattern I've seen over and over again. It does take 
an incredible amount of passion and persistence and uh, frankly, obsession, right? Like right. this isn't something that's going to happen if you are open to working 45 minutes in between watching episodes of Lost on evenings. This is uh, kind of a, an this is this is the all in path, right? This is this is you're working late into the night, you're working weekends, and you are working on problems that that you can't stop talking about because you care about them so damn much, right? Like this is this is the path for someone who almost is obnoxious when they're at parties because you know they they don't want to you know people don't want to hear them talk about Bitcoin again or talk about. Uh, <laughs> you know, the spiritual path they're on or talk about, you know, a, a new approach to growing food, right. Or, or health, you know, this, this is the path for, for people who are, uh, people who are, uh, uh, obsessed, but honestly, it's, it's hard to know if you're going to be obsessed, uh, until you've had some initial success, because often it is being unlocked and being unchained by a, a new path that, that sort of lights the way, to, to the next stage. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't count yourself out, uh, after hearing what I just said. Right. Is, is there, uh, in terms of business models at this point, um, would you just continue scaling the, the model that you have, uh, or is there room to potentially change to a different one? Like I can imagine kind of like yourself, you know, starting with info products and then really seeing a software need. I know a lot of other people who have done this, uh, as well, you know, uh, yep. Laura Roder from, from Edgar, uh, and, and a few others, um, would, would, it just seems to be, software seems to be, I don't want to say easy. I definitely don't want to say easy. I have a little bit of uh, a foot in the door <laughs> in the software world, and it's definitely not easy at all. There's a lot of things that go along with it, but it seems to be a natural, I guess you could say, progression. Once you find uh, an audience, obviously, and you're providing value to them, and you're offering them products, you're consulting with them, you know, you're going to find some things that are going to be done repetitively that a, so a piece of software could potentially help solve. And I feel like that's you know, potentially a business model that uh, would, I would say, be easier to reach seven figures, obviously putting in a ton of work into it, but uh, yeah. than, than others. Is that true or is that kind of a, a misstatement? Yeah. So I'd say the the way I think about this is as a movement from low cost of product creation to high cost of product creation. So generally speaking, when it costs very little to create a product, you'll have a lot of competitors, but that's where the relationship with your audience comes in. So when you're just getting started, you've got 2,000 you know, passionate followers, hopefully, mm -hmm. and the differentiator there is your unique approach to solving their problem, you, your unique personal brand, how you've historically taken care of your audience, that, that is what really differentiates your, your product and your offering in a crowded space. As you get bigger and you have more resources, you're going to enter spaces where the, the cost of product creation is much higher. So it costs a lot more to produce software than it takes to produce like a membership website, right? It costs a lot more to produce a custom made physical product than it costs to create, you know, than it costs to sell an affiliate product or it costs to, you know, sell an ebook or consulting. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, the, the, the more it costs to produce a product, the greater moat you have around your business, right? Like for someone to replicate lead pages is super hard to do at this point or to replicate uh drip.co super hard to do there's already entrance in the market there's a huge talent war for software developers but that's also true of physical products that's also true of like consumer electronics that's also true of things that you know have a huge logistics component so i would say as you get more resources and you as you have a better understanding of your market you can uh afford to spend more on product R and D. And for some people that's going to be software for other people, it's going to be, you know, physical products, electronics, you know, wh whatever it is, it's going to be harder to do. But once you can get there, there's, there's a lot more money to be made because there's just a, a lot fewer participants. Right. Awesome. Okay. So f final thing before I finish up, we've already been talking for over an hour. I can't even believe it, but it's just, 
you could tell it's just all this kind of amazing information. I just don't want to cut you off because it's, it's just so great. Uh, I imagine a lot of people are really getting a lot of value out of this. So thank you, Clay. I really appreciate it. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about are, you know, so, some of the big mistakes that people make while trying to climb this ladder. You know, what makes them slip off and, you know, how would you recommend they uh, get that tight grip on that on that rung so they keep climbing high? Yeah, I think the the biggest thing I see people do, and this is a, a, an internal thing, is they start doubting what they know, right? They start getting pulled in a whole bunch of different directions. They, you know, they, they have a little bit of success. And next thing you know, they're in like 10 masterminds and they've bought 20 other eBooks and they spent a lot of the profit they have on like some kind of fancy car or they're, you know, they're three Xing the number of vacations they used to take. Mm -hmm. And they, they end up falling, they end up falling off the ladder. So it's really doubting yourself in, in ADD are, are the biggest distractions that, that I've seen. I, I think that it generally speaking at rung two of this ladder, you should, uh, you sh like, you should be maintaining the same lifestyle at rung three that you had at rung two, and you should be ju working just as hard at rung three and at rung two as you were at, at rung one. So it's really letting off the gas pedal, getting distracted, not having confidence. That's, that's really what I see. I, I, I wish I could say more, but like, it's, uh, you know, it, it really comes back to the, to the fundamentals, like try and meditate every day if you can. Yeah, no, true. Do, do you practice meditation? I do. Yeah. It's changed my life. It, it, it really has changed my life. And I think had a bigger impact on my business success than just about anything, any, any tactic I could talk about or anything I could mention. It, it, it really has like, um, you know, meditation allows me like maybe another quarter of a second of willpower in between like saying that stupid shit I should never say <laughs> and um and saying like yeah maybe I shouldn't say that you know um and and there's just so many instances of things like that 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 occur every day that you know meditation saves saves my butt so Awesome. Yeah, yeah I, I practice meditation too. It's 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 done amazing things for me and my focus and creativity and whatnot. And just allowing me to breathe a little bit between all the crazy stuff that we do uh, in our personal life and our business life. It's it's definitely a much needed thing. And I can see why a lot of entrepreneurs, especially very successful ones, uh, make it a priority to do every single day. So uh, anyway, Clay, like, dude, this has been amazing. Do you have any final words before before we finish up, or have we sort of covered everything? Yeah, I'd say uh, the final words are, if you're listening to this in audio-only format, be sure to go to the show notes. We're not going to put it behind an opt-in wall or anything like that. Um, I'll provide, you know, some really thorough notes, uh, a transcript, uh, a mind map, and some some worksheets that will benefit you in, in quite a few ways. So don't just hear this as a, a bunch, as, as like several general concepts. I would take this as an actual blueprint to get started. And I would, for example, sit down this evening or next evening, um, pull out a worksheet and say, Hey, you know, the one traffic source I'm going to focus on is X, you know, the one conversion mechanism I'm going to double down is Y the one product that I feel I should create is Z. document your assumptions, plot out, you know, where you're at now, when you think you can be at rung two, when you think you can be at rung three, mm -hmm. and start making these things very concrete for you because unless you do that, you're never going to move into action and this is just gonna be a, 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 like a series of entertaining ideas you know, where you can like debate the finer points of some nuanced thing I said, you know, as the, you know, in the 15th comment on here, like I would try and get away from your monkey mind, you know, obsessing about that mm -hmm. and start getting into action. Um, so download all that stuff. We've got a, a bunch of materials here that can help you out and, and make all this very concrete for you. So I just say, take that stuff, start documenting your assumptions, start documenting the actions you're going to take and just move forward. Man, golden information. Thank you guys uh, so much for listening in all the way through. Clay, thank you so much. We always appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your amazing wisdom. And uh, is is there a question that you would like people to answer perhaps related to all this in the comment section? I'd love to have people ha have another reason to come over to the comment section uh, to visit the show notes and get all the great sort of uh, downloads and whatnot, um, but also so they can kind of participate and maybe kind of start their journey off right. Is it, do, do you have any ideas for maybe a prompt that they can then answer in the comment section for this post? Yeah. So 
I what what I would encourage people to do is come into the comments section and tell us the conversion mechanism that you're going to focus on. So if it's one-on-one -on -one selling, I would say that if it's a if it's a sales page and you really enjoy sort of writing out the case for purchasing your thing, say that. If it's video, say that. If it's webinars, tell us, but just tell us how you plan to convert members of your audience into buyers and tell us why and, uh, and, and leave that in the comment section. And, um, we, I can give away actually like two, uh, lifetime memberships to, to lead pages to two, you know, randomly selected, uh, commenters. Uh, I think that'll be fun. And Dude, holy crap, that's awesome. I wasn't, I, I wasn't, uh, like you weren't leading. fishing for that. No, I yep. wasn't. That's, that's <laughs> super cool. Thank you, Clay. I appreciate that. I, okay guys. So that, that's a huge value in, in, in terms of, you know, what you're getting there. So two lifetime accounts, to lead pages. Does this count even for people who have lead pages already? Sure. Yep, absolutely. Cool. Uh, so come to the show notes. I'll, I'll give you the short link uh, shortly after this and leave that comment there. Uh, and if they don't have an audience yet, still kind of, you know, have them comment on what they would consider to be one that would work for them and their personality. Um, sure. I'd say if, if, if you don't have an audience yet, um, tell us the, the, the general topic of the blog that you would generate a minimum viable audience around. Cool, and then we'll come back, uh, I would say in, in about a month, you know, because people take time to listen to these episodes. So we'll say a month after this episode goes live, Clay and I will will uh, get our heads together uh, as we often do and kind of just randomly select a couple people who leave a comment there. So Clay, that's amazing. Thank you, thank you for that, um, you know, amazing gift. Appreciate it. A absolutely, um, Pat, it's always fun uh, talking with you. Um, Thanks for the opportunity and props to everyone who's listening to this podcast, looking to make their life better, looking to make the world a better place, um, you know, not only uh, for themselves, but also for their their families and their communities. There's no other, there's no better way to do it than entrepreneurship. Here, here. All right. Take care, Clay. Take care. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed that amazing interview and basically lesson and tutorial and workshop with Clay Collins. Again, you can find him at uh, leadpages.net, obviously. If you wanna check out Lead Pages through my affiliate link, head on over to smartpassiveincome.com slash leadpages. But before you do that, actually, I would head over to the show notes, smartpassiveincome.com slash session 263, and leave your comment there because you can win a lifetime membership and subscription to Lead Pages, which is a huge value. I mean, absolutely, in two of them. And the way you do that is you go to the comment section and you leave your number one conversion mechanism. So how are you going to convert your audience into buyers? Pick that one mechanism. That's I love that strategy because it's not even a strategy. It's just, you know, essentialism in marketing, right? Pick one that works or that is going to be the one that works for you and focus on that one. Use all your resources for that one and not spread yourself too thin. So come over to the blog, smartpassiveincome.com slash session 263. Leave a comment there and uh, at some point in the future, uh, like I said, we will come in and we will randomly select two commenters to win those lifetime subscriptions to lead pages. And uh, yeah, just come on and let us know what you think as well. So thank you so much, Clay, for all of that. Thank you for all of you who listened all the way through. I appreciate you so much. And finally, if you haven't been to the blog for a while, come on over, smartpassiveincome.com, or if you wanna get even more podcasts from me right now, head on over to askpat.com or look up my other show, Ask Pat, because that's where I answer voicemail questions from you. Literally, voicemail questions from you five days a week and there's, you know, we're approaching a thousand episodes. I'll be giving away some really cool things later in the year when we uh, hit a thousand. So make sure you subscribe to that show as well. And we also do Ask Pat Live on Fridays on my Facebook page at 1.30 p.m. Pacific every Friday or, or most Fridays as long as I'm there. We do giveaways there too. So check it out, facebook.com slash smartpassiveincome. That's Fridays, 1.30 p.m. Pacific. I'll get your uh, as many questions, answers uh, as I can, and we'll do some giveaways. It'll be a lot of fun. Thanks, guys. Take care, and I will see you in the next episode. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Smart Passive Income Podcast at www.smartpassiveincome.com. Hey, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you're looking for a new podcast to add to your rotation, I highly recommend Problem Solvers, hosted by Jason Pfeiffer, who's been on the show a few times, actually. As you probably heard in the credits, both our shows are on the Entrepreneur Podcast Network. 
On Problem Solvers, Entrepreneur's Editor-in-Chief tells the stories of real founders that solved real problems in their businesses, helping listeners get through any obstacles in their own ventures. And each episode is really distinct and easy to follow, and they're bite-sized too, usually around 15 to 20 minutes. And Jason pulls each story out himself so you can avoid the same crippling problems. Matt and I were recently on the show in episode 302, and Jason recently hosted a great episode on whether anyone could be too quote-unquote curious for a traditional career. Listen to Problem Solvers right now on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or Stitcher.